Dr. Cassie from NABC's Vetfolio and the host of vet to vet Cats with chronic kidney disease need nutritional and medical support to extend their lives and improve their quality of life. Here to talk about another way to keep our feline CKD patients healthy is Dr. Mark Aserno. Dr. Aserno spent 12 years at Louisiana State University developing one of the most advanced nephrology programs in the world. He's currently a professor at Midwestern University's Veterinary Teaching Hospital, where his clinical and research interests include hypertension, kidney disease, and renal replacement therapies. Dr. Aserno, it is so great to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to get into this talk because we're talking about uremic toxins, and I hope I'm not the only person with this question when I ask, what exactly are we talking about? What are uremic toxins? So uremic toxins are things that are usually filtered by the kidney, um, often nitrogenous breakdown products, things like BUN and creatinine that we see on blood work all the time. Um, the difference is the stuff we're going to be talking about today BUN and creatinine, you know, if I was to come up and inject you with a big bolus of either one of them, you wouldn't feel particularly sick. We use them because they're a convenient measure of how well the kidneys are functioning, specifically glomerular filtration rate. Um, the things the toxins we're going to be talking about today are um, toxins that are derived from the gut that um, come into circulation and actually damage the kidneys. And they're not things that we ordinarily measure, but we know now through studies um, that they actually uh, accelerate uh, chronic kidney disease by causing inflammation, causing damage to the kidneys. Um, and some of these toxins are seen with chronic kidney disease because there is this change in the microbiome. So the microbiome is this, this um, large quantity, thousands upon thousands of bacteria, different types of bacteria, fungi, viruses that all live in the GI tract. And as chronic kidney disease progresses, the diversity, if you will, of, of, these, um, of these viruses and bacteria and fungi um, change and they decrease. There's almost a collapse, if you will, the diversity uh, goes away. And what we're left with is these um, microbiome that can produce these uremic toxins that get absorbed in the colon and then can damage the kidneys. So just to make sure that I'm understanding, we see this lack of diversity in the microbiome in our, in our kidney patients. Is it the result of kidney disease? No one knows exactly why or how it happens, but as kidney disease progresses, the diversity of this microbiome decreases. And so we see fewer, if you will, the richness of the number of, of bacteria decreases. And then we have an increase in bacteria that can actually produce substances that can harm the kidneys. Okay. And you said normally with a healthy kidney, these would be cleared by the kidney? That's right. So normally okay. with a healthy kidney, first they'd be cleared, but second of all, the microbiome of the GI tract would be so diverse that the amount of this stuff being produced wouldn't be significant. I see. So we have, we lose the diversity of the microbiome in the gut, which causes an uptick of the production of these toxins that can no longer be cleared effectively by the kidneys and, and they end up increasing inflammation and causing damage to the kidneys. Correct. Yeah. These toxins actually damage the kidney directly. Okay. Okay. Wow. That is just not something that I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I really like managing kidney patients. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that we're diving into this topic. Yeah. It's really something that none of us thought about until recently, right? And it's, it's interesting because the microbiome of the gut has been associated now with so many different diseases. It's not surprising that we're finding this link between chronic kidney disease and the microbiome. I agree. It's a little, it's a little crazy how much of an influence we're finding this microbiome has over so many different healthy situations and disease processes. Correct. Yeah. I really, I mean, you know, people now they've associated with all kinds of things like um, neurologic disease and, and uh, loss of cognitive ability, right? So who would have thought that 10 years ago, people would have thought that you were kind of crazy um, for thinking that somehow bacteria in the gut is linked to your, you know, brain function. And now we're finding it's all interrelated. Absolutely. It's fascinating. Well, I'm guessing because there is a, that loss of diversity in the microbiome causing this uptick in the production of these uremic toxins, probably supporting that microbiome can help to reduce the overall production and amount of these uremic toxins. My first question, I guess, would be, is that correct to guess that? And two, what else can we do to help reduce the production of these uremic toxins? Yeah, so people are attacking this problem from a number of different perspectives, and certainly one of them is supporting the microbiome. 
it impacts people as well. So people have looked at this in animal models. Um, can we, for example, uh, one of the things that we know that happens in in people and in cats and in in other species as the kidneys fail, um, not only is this loss of microbiome, but also the GI transit time, the 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 amount of time it takes things to get out increases. And that increased time in the colon gives additional time for these bacteria to produce these uremic toxins. And so some folks have looked at, for example, in mice models, what if what if we give a laxative? And they have found that we can decrease the quantity of these toxins. So supporting the microbiome, decreasing the amount of time, stuff sits in the colon. Um, and then the third way is quite honestly using an absorptive substance, right? Can we mix something in the food that that's relatively palatable, that doesn't interfere with, with uh, normal in, in digestion, that when it gets to the colon kind of scoops up these toxins and they go out in the feces as opposed to being resorbed? So you mentioned absorbatives. What what are these absorbatives that you're talking about? So in particular, I'm talking about a supplement called Porous One. And what it does is it, it travels pretty much undigested through the GI tract. Um, and then when it gets to the colon, it's able to scoop up these um, uremic toxins that directly damage the kidney and carry them out in the feces. And so um, basically, you know, it's one way of attacking the problem is just uh, binding up the toxin and getting rid of it. Absolutely. And then I'm thinking, you know, if we're absorbing them in the colon and then combining that with a laxative, you know, I've of course considered laxatives in kidney patients, but I've always approached it from the thought of, you know, thinking about that little raisin kitty that's so dehydrated and so that stool is really hard to pass. But it sounds like even with normal stool, really implementing some GI therapies can have a beneficial effect in these patients. Yeah, so there's actually a really nice study on cats um, and and their their litter box, if you will, habits. And what they found was that the average cat uh, defecates twice a day, but the average chronic kidney disease cat is like once every other day. And so you can see where this stuff is sitting in the colon and sitting in the colon. Um, and so increasing uh, defecation by using things like laxatives, at least in other animal models, has been significant resulted in significant decreases in these uremic toxins and certainly adding an absorptive could only further decrease the amount of these uremic toxins that are being absorbed and damaging the kidney um, that, that, can, that they can do their bad work really. So um, really, I think the answer is going to be a multimodal approach of supporting the microbiome, making sure our cats are defecating uh, regularly and using an absorptive to get rid of these uremic toxins. Absolutely. I'm so glad that we're having this conversation because that that's news to me about the the defecating every other day. And again, I would have gone back to it from a hydration standpoint, but it, you know, obviously this can have much more detrimental effects than just, you know, a dehydrated animal that's maybe uncomfortable because they're not passing as much stool. Yep, absolutely. You know, uh, other things that we can do to help support these cats are um, there are products now to uh, increase appetite. Um, and so that's another way we can support. You mentioned earlier that our cats are kind of, you know, crispy looking and 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 dehydrated. Well, um, there's products out there now that increase uh, fluid consumption as well. And so um, there's lots of different things that we can do in order to support these patients. And I think that really the best chance we have is kind of this multimodal effect, right? You know, get them to eat, get them to drink water. Um, let's get the feces out of the colon quicker. Um, let's... Um, uh, make sure that we try to absorb these toxins before they can actually do their dirty work, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thinking about um, a product like Porous One to absorb these uremic toxins, do we know as far as when these uremic toxins begin to have that uptick, when do we start Porous One? Is it Do we have kind of like an iris stage that we should be aware of? Yeah, so I'm aware of three good studies right now that are actually studying Porous One and its effects. And the data, as far as I'm aware, is, is not out yet. But my, my personal belief is that the sooner we start, the better. And so I tend to look at things like SDMA. Um, I tend to look at things like urine-specific gravity. I tend to look at size of kidneys. And when I see like an iris stage one, and when I'm reasonably, reasonably convinced that we have an iris stage one kidney cat, that's the time I would probably start implementing these strategies um, to make sure that we minimize the damage early on. And therefore we can extend not just length of life, but quality of life. And my mind is like blown a little bit here because when we talk about an iris stage one, it's it tends to be a pretty early diagnosis and not a whole lot of intervention. And if you would have said, hey, I think you should intervene more aggressively at an iris stage one. My thought would not have gone to the GI tract. 
Yeah. And, you know, that we're learning earlier and earlier, there's people studying the damage that phosphorus does. And now they're suggesting that even if phosphorus is completely normal, there's other parameters we should be looking at and perhaps starting a kidney disease diet much sooner than we would have early, uh, previously. Wow. It just, it, I, I love talking about kidney disease because it's always changing and it changes so fast and, and there's so much that we can do and we're intervening earlier and earlier. And I feel like I see the positive effects in our patients clinically. Uh, I, I love the idea of having another way that we can intervene to help these patients. Of course, you know, when we're talking about chronic kidney disease patients, a lot of times we'll see comorbidities and things like that. So would we have any reason not to start porous one or, or any of these other absorptive therapies? Yeah, no, I, 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 do, I think it's pretty benign. And I, I think the sooner we get these toxins absorbed and out of the system, the better. Um, we're learning so much more about chronic kidney disease. You know, it's funny, I, I was speaking recently to a, a group of veterinarians, and I said that, you know, two years ago, chronic kidney disease was a little bit of a snooze fest. There wasn't much going on. And all of a sudden, there's just a ton of stuff that has come out in the last two years um, about early intervention and, and phosphorus monitoring that we didn't know about just, uh, you know, two years ago, if phosphorus was normal, we were all happy. But now we know there's other things we should be measuring, right, and intervening sooner, or at least potentially sooner um, than we would have just a little while ago. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's what has been so fun to keep up with the changes with chronic kidney disease, because you're finding not only do we need to intervene early, but now we have so many options of things that we can do. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, we're learning more and more every day. Absolutely. So we touched on this a little bit, but quality of life, big battle in these patients sometimes. And we don't just want to focus on treating the numbers, treating the iris stage. We want to create the best quality of life for the longest quantity that we can in our patients. So how can Porous One help our patients and what other types of therapies can we implement to really make sure we're giving our patients the best quality of life possible? Yeah, that's a great question. And really, I mean, as veterinarians, everything we focus on really should be quality of life, right? It's never about length of life. Um, but the two are definitely intertwined to some extent, right? So a patient that's feeling good and eating well um, is probably going, is, you know, the quality of life has improved and the length of life will improve with it. So, you know, the strategies that I always employ is we've got to get our patients to eat. And so things like appetite stimulants um, are important. Um, we know now that getting uh, them to defecate regularly is, is important. And so, you know, some form of laxatives. Um, we know that there are the uremic toxins that get resorbed and we want to stop that. And so, you know, a great way to do that is an absorptive product. So we're talking about Porous One here, which of course is a supplement that we're using to help manage patients with chronic kidney disease. And I think supplements, they, they're just approached differently in different situations. I know I personally like using supplements in my patients with chronic disease, including chronic kidney disease, but you know, not everybody feels the same way. And I'm curious to know what your opinion is on the role of supplements in help managing chronic disease in general, but chronic kidney disease specifically. Yeah, and I think we have to make an important distinction between supplements for which there is good science to back up and supplements for which, you know, are, are not necessarily uh, borne out by science. Um, and when we're talking about porous one, I think there's a clear link between these uremic toxins that are being produced in the colon being absorbed and then damaging the kidney. And so to me, that's a supplement that that's definitely worth adding into our treatment. You know, um, a number of years ago, if we had said that just changing the diet could have a tremendous impact on the length and quality of life of our patient, I think people would have thought you to be a little bit different. Um, but we now know that diet plays a big role. Um, and I think the same thing for supplements. You know, if there's good science to back it up, well, I'm all for it. I love that. Up with multimodal therapy. <laughs> exactly. Well, Dr. Aserno, this has really been a fascinating conversation. I mean, I'm telling you, when I heard uremic toxins, I my brain immediately said, like, what, what is that? And am I the only person who doesn't know? Um, but this was a really interesting, and I love the idea of having kind of another target for therapy in our chronic kidney disease, cats being the GI tract. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all of the wonderful information. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you to DECRA for partnering with us for this edition of Vet to Vet. 
Check out NABC's vetfolio.com for more of our V2V discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.